Hello, Bridgeway, and praise the Lord. It's good to see you again on another Sunday, and today I'm beginning a brand new three-week series. Usually I'll do an Old Testament character study. Uh, this time, for the next three weeks, it'll be an Old Testament character study, but we're going to be talking about a couple of widows and a couple of prophets. We're coming out of 1 Kings chapter 17 today, and before I read that passage, let me tell you that the series is called House Call. Uh, the prophet of God makes a house call to a widow, and amazing things happen as the Lord does these divine hookups, if you will, these divine meetings. In fact, just uh, a few years ago, I did home visits as a pastor of this mega church called Bridgeway. We had people submit their names, we put it in a box, a team of people drew out the names, and we had of hundreds of names, over 500 names, where I told folk, I want to come to your house, I want to visit you, and I want to pray for you. And of hundreds of names, we picked 22. So in that year, for that nine-month ministry year, I made 22 home visits. Of course, you just saw a visit we made recently to uh, Un Young Lee, who was dealing with some personal health issues. I just wanted to encourage her, so I brought her over a meal. And that really helps us understand what this series and what this message is all about, and that is this. Whenever God sends a man of God or a woman of God or the word of God to your home, it's always to bless you. It's always to encourage you. It's never to harm you. So when I made these 22 home visits, I'll tell you, it was taxing doing that in nine months, trying to figure that into my schedule along with so many other things. But I never walked away from a home visit feeling like this wasn't worth it. In fact, there were several different lessons I learned. One lesson I learned was about the commute. People who come to Bridgeway Community Church come from near and far. We drove as far as uh, Northern Virginia and beyond, Eastern Shore, north of Baltimore, Washington, D.C. It was amazing uh, the distance we traveled, for some maybe even an hour, hour and a half. Why am I saying that? Because what we produced here at Bridgeway Community Church was worth people driving. Someone says it like this, a church alive is worth the drive. And I found out just how far people were driving to come to Bridgeway. There was a second learning that I gained that year. I learned not only about the commute, but I learned about the stories. How did you get to Bridgeway? How did you hear about us? And people would tell us, a friend told me, or I heard you on the radio, or I saw you online, or I Googled multicultural churches. But the stories of what God has done in this ministry and through this ministry to touch the lives of the people who I had the privilege of visiting and hearing their stories, it really blessed me. I learned about people who got saved and families that got restored. I learned about people whose finances got better as a result of principles that they, that they employed based on God's word. I was just so encouraged, and I hope they were too. Well, here's the trip thing. There was one guy that we went to go visit, he wasn't really expecting us. You see, he didn't really go to the church, but his daughter and uh, the mother of his daughter came to Bridgeway. And this girl who was somewhere in her preteens filled out her daddy's name, put his number, and put it in the box. And it just so happened, we drew his name. So when my people called and said, Pastor from Bridgeway Community Church wants to come visit you, this guy's like, uh, yeah, oh, okay. <laughs> so we drive up to Baltimore, into the city in this row home. When we walked up the street, there was one guy selling stuff on the corner. And we go into this man's house, and you could tell he was a bit uncomfortable. And as we spent time with him, we encouraged him. We prayed for him, and we blessed him. We left him with a few hundred dollars as well, just to let him know that God loves him, and God can be generous with him. Story after story, I wish I could tell you each and every one of them, but I'm here to tell you God still makes house calls. In fact, one of the things that blessed me about these house calls was not just the commute and not just the stories, but the diversity. I mean, we visited people who were black and Asian, Hispanic and white, younger, older, some single families, some uh, nuclear families, some extended families, just absolutely amazing, the diversity ethnically 
and economically, from big mansion sized houses to small row homes in Baltimore. Well, it doesn't really matter where you live. Guess what? I'm right there right now with you. I'm making a house call today. Whether you're looking on your cell phone or whether you're sitting in front of a TV screen like my family does and last, last uh, Saturday or Sunday morning at noon, Sunday afternoon at noon, there were seven or eight of us just sitting around, enjoying the service, worshiping, hearing God's word. So I want to speak to you today, whoever you are and wherever you are, to remind you so that you will never forget that God is still in the house calling business. God can still get to you through the word. And what we find out in the scripture today is that whenever God comes to your house, it's to bring you hope, it's to bring you healing, and it's to bring you help. I'm gonna talk about that hope today, that healing next week, and the help even for the helpless the week after that. Speaking of being in homes and needing a little bit of help and a little bit of healing and a little bit of help, let me tell you, if you haven't heard yet, that Pastor David Mitchner and his family are dealing with some grief right now. And before I pray for the message, I just want to let you know that last Sunday during our 10 o'clock service, his father, uh, David Mitchner Sr., passed away due to COVID. His mother has COVID as well and some other family members. So let's make sure that we pray for the Mitchners and ask that the Spirit of God would comfort them during this time. And for the rest of you dealing with a need for healing, I hope you'll be here next week as we pray uh, for your healing as I talk from the Word of God and how God used the prophet in the life of the widow to bring healing. But the hope that David Mitchner's father has and had was the same hope my dad had when he passed away and Pastor Dan's father had when he passed away. And me and Pastor Dan were joking that maybe all three of our fathers are up there smoking heavenly cigars right now. Who knows? But I'm going to pray for you, Pastor Mitchner and Donna and Dusty and, and, and Davey and Cody and all of their uh, family members right now as we go into God's word. Will you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we, we know that this can be a tough season for so many people because of COVID. And we know that many people have lost their lives. Many have gotten sick and infected. And we just want to pray, Lord Jesus, for those that have lost loved ones. When they hurt, we hurt. When they grieve, we grieve. And so we pray for Pastor Mitchner's mother, that you would heal her body and turn her around. For his other family members, that you'd heal their bodies and turn them around. And we pray that they would be encouraged by the, the hope that they have and that they know that David Mitchner Sr. is now with you as his life has proclaimed the gospel. Now, as we go into this word, we pray that this word would go into us. In Jesus' name, amen. And amen. When God comes to your house, when God makes a house call, he wants to bring you hope. He wants to bring you healing. He wants to bring you help. He never comes to harm you. And that's the story we find when we get into 1 Kings chapter 17, verses 7 through 16. 1 Kings chapter 17, verses 7 through 16. I'm reading from the New International Version, 1984, and this is what it says. Sometime later, the brook dried up because there had been no, room, no rain in the land. Then the word of the Lord came to him, speaking about Elijah. And in verse 9, go at once to Zarephath of Sidon and stay there. I have commanded a widow in that place to supply you with food. So he went to Zarephath. When he came to the town gate, a widow was there gathering sticks. He called to her and asked, would you bring me a little water in a jar? so I may have a drink. As she was going to get it, he called and said, and bring me please a, a piece of bread. As surely as the Lord your God lives, she replied, I don't have any bread, only a handful of flour in a jar and a little oil in a jug. I am gathering sticks to take home and make a meal for myself and my son that we may eat it and die. Why would she want to eat it and die? 
because there was a famine in the land and she only had a little flour and a little oil gathering sticks for a fire. She's going to make her final meal and then there's not going to be any more food. She's anticipating that she and her son are going to die. Verse 13, Elijah said to her, don't be afraid. Go home and do as I have said. But first, make a small cake of bread for me from what you have and bring it to me and then make something for yourself and your son. For this is what the Lord, the God of Israel says, the jar of flour will not be used up and the jug of oil will not run dry until the day the Lord gives rain on the land. She went away and did as Elijah told her. So there was food every day for Elijah and the woman and her family. Here's the last verse, verse 16. For the jar of flour was not used up and the jug of oil did not run dry in keeping with the word the Lord spoke or had spoken by Elijah. The word of the Lord spoken by Elijah. Here is this widow and she had just a little flour in the jar, just a little oil in the jug and one last meal before it was time for her to die. And yet, the prophet says, not only do I want you to get me some water, but I want you to actually cook that last meal and give it to me. Now, as a mother, a widow, a single mom with a son, you only have one last meal. You've been rationing it out during this time of famine. And now you're down to the last of what you have. And some man of God shows up and says, give me what you have. How many of you would obey that? How many of you would say, yes, sure. I'm going to give you the food out of my kid's mouth. I'm going to give you the food out of my mouth. And you stranger, I'm going to give it to you. But you see, remember what I said earlier. When God makes a house call, He's coming to bring you hope and and healing and help, never to harm you. And this woman must have been a woman of faith because she recognized he was a man of God and that he was speaking God's word. And so she went and she did exactly what the prophet said with the little that she had. Can I tell you something? God can work with a little. God doesn't need much. He can work with just a little to do everything he needs to do. And what this woman needed was a physical miracle and a spiritual blessing. You see, a physical miracle is when God provides something that you need in the physical realm and healing, but a spiritual blessing is when he gives you hope and peace. And a word from God can give you both. A word from God can not only give you the physical miracle that you need, but it can give you the spiritual blessing that you need. And this widow recognized that this wasn't any stranger. She recognized that this was the voice of God through the man of God to touch her family. And so because of her faith, she was able to see God do a miracle in her life. I'm here to tell someone today that you may just have a little, but if you'll give that little to God, he'll do what he did with that little boy's lunch who had only five loaves and two fish. God multiplied it and fed 5,000. Just a mustard seed of faith is all God needs in order to do a miracle. Just touching the hem of his garment is all someone needs to do in order to be made whole. The reality is God doesn't need a lot from you. He just needs a little. God is not asking you to do everything that he can do. He just wants you to give him a little. Why? Because if you give him a little, he can multiply and make it much. But if you give him nothing, then he knows you don't have faith. Just a little faith is enough for God to do what he wants to do in your life. But if you show nothing, that means you're showing no faith. You're saying, God, just have favor, but don't give me uh, anything uh, because I'm not giving you anything. God is saying, just give me a little. He doesn't need much. But man, when you give God a little, a little faith, a little praise, a little glory. He'll be a way maker. He'll make a way when there is no way. He'll be a miracle worker. He'll be a promise keeper. He's the light in the darkness. My God, that is who you are, as the song says. So let me pause for a second. What are you holding on to 
And what do you need God to do for you? Just give him a little out of faith and watch him do so much. So the prophet says to her in verse 13, I read, don't be afraid. Go home and do as I have said. Go home as you said you were going to do, basically. But first, make a small cake of bread for me, for what you have, from what you have, and bring it to me, and then make something for yourself and son. I want you to notice this three-step process. This is the progression of God's provision. The progression of God's provision. Here's the very first step. Faith over fear. Back to verse 13. Listen to what it says. The prophet says, Elijah says, don't be afraid. Go home and do what you said you were going to do. So the first step in the progression toward your provision is faith over fear. And I say, don't face your fears. Faith your fears. And then go and do. That's what he says. Do not be afraid. Go and do what you said you're going to do. Faith your fears. Go and do what God has asked you to do. You don't need to do a lot. You just need to express faith. But you see, God wants you to express faith because that shows that you are willing to trust him for the rest. So how do we put it? Do your best. Let God do the rest. Do your best. Let God do the rest. And he will. But first, in this progression towards your provision, you have to demonstrate faith. You take one step, God will take two. And so as we talk about these three steps, this, this, this progression toward the provision that God has for you, the first one is the faith, your fears. The second one is first before last. First before last. Let me go back to verse 13. Don't be afraid. Go home and do as you have said. But what? First, make a small cake for me. <laughs> Bring it to me. Then make something for yourself. You see, the progression towards your provision is not only faithing your fears and doing what God says do, but secondly, it's actually putting God first, first over last. You see, when God asks us to do something, when we truly are followers of his, then we will always put what is first, first. Jesus put it this way, Matthew 6, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these other things will be added unto you. Don't worry about what you will eat or what you will drink, he says. Your God will take care of you, but first, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. If we're going to look at this, this progression toward God's provision in your life, we got to get things in order. This is why when God talks about giving to him, he talks about giving of your first fruits, not your leftovers. As soon as you get an earnings check, you're supposed to take the first of it and give it back to God as a gratitude offering and out of obedience. And when you do that, guess what God does? God begins to move in your first steps. God begins to move because he sees that you're putting him as a priority. And so in this progression, we see first over last. Don't give God of your leftovers. Give God of what you have first. And then here this woman has the last of her food, and God is still requiring her to give it up first before he blesses her. But here's the thing. If she doesn't do it, she doesn't live. Because she'll eat that last meal, and then she'll die. But God sends a prophet in the, in the nick of time because he brings hope and life. And when the prophet came, this woman had more hope in the word of God than in the bread that she had in her hand. Let me ask you a question. Do you have more hope in God or what you have in your hand, what you can do for yourself? Many people choose what they have in their hand. Many people choose what they can do for themselves because they don't trust God. 
You see, you've got to make a decision between the word of God and what you want to do with what you have. But if you will take what you have and give it over to God, God will do a miracle and you will have more life, more quality of life, more quantity of life, not dying over the last bit. And that's what happens with people. They fight over the last bit that they have and they want to protect it. How about you listen to the word of God? Give it to God and watch life more abundantly. What have we said? You got to have faith over your fear and then go and do. And we said then first over last. He said, but doesn't the scripture say the first will be last and last will be first? Yes, but that's about position. That's about serving God and serving others. It has nothing to do with provision. When it comes to provision, you put your first before God and let him do the rest. Or another way to put it, you do your best and let God do the rest. We're looking at this progression for provision, if you will, and here's the third step in this progression, and we see it back in the passage when we go uh, back to it. We see fulfillment beyond lack. Fulfillment beyond lack. Here's this woman lacking everything. She only has this meal left, her last meal. She's gonna die, her son's gonna die, This man shows up named Elijah, who's a prophet of God, who followed God's word by going down to this place, Zarephath. And he meets the widow that God says, I have a widow down there who I've already set up for you, a divine hookup. And sure enough, the prophet then tells her exactly what to do. And she does what the prophet says. And when she got that word from God, you see what happened? Fulfillment. Fulfillment over lack. And that is really the, the, the blossoming of God's provision. That is the fulfillment of God's prophecy that you will lack nothing. And so it says in verse 15, so there was food every day. It says in verse 15, she went away and did as Elijah had told her. So there was food every day for Elijah and for the woman and her family. I love this last verse, verse 16. For the jar of flour was not used up, and the jug of oil did not run dry, in keeping with the word of the Lord spoken by Elijah. Isn't that beautiful? The fulfillment above the lacking and beyond the lacking because she obeyed God's word. When you obey God with your resources, your jar will never go empty. Your oil will never run dry. God will always provide for you. Listen, God's been good to the Andersons for so long, for so many years when we started this church. And we've gone through ups and downs financially for, you know, so many years. In the last several years, God has just blessed our socks off and we've been able to pay our bills and things have been able to go great. We got a new house that we weren't, planning on getting, and God has just blessed us, right? Well, my son got married last weekend, and that's my son Isaiah, by the way. Congratulations, Isaiah and Kiri. And we didn't know we were going to be doing this wedding in our home, but God blessed us with a home that was beautiful enough to do a wedding in it. But we had a little medical emergency in our house the week of this wedding, and it kind of wiped us out financially. Everybody's okay. No, no, No human being was hurt, okay? but we do have animals. And we had one animal that had a medical condition. And here's the thing, I used to talk about people who paid money for animals. I'm like, why would you buy an animal, first of all? And then secondly, why would you buy insurance for an animal? Animals have like healthcare insurance, like like human beings, but there are a lot of human beings that don't have it, right? And so that just seems weird to me. And who would ever pay hundreds, if not thousands of dollars for an animal? Look, you're just gonna have to go to heaven, puppy, because there ain't no way I'm gonna be paying thousand dollars, you know, for you, God bless you, let's dig a hole in the backyard. I mean, that was sort of my, my way. I remember we moved into this one neighborhood, you know, 20 years ago when Asia was just a baby and the people that lived in the cul-de-sac, they had, they had a, a German shepherd uh, in, in a, like a wheelchair. Like it had, it had, you know, cables around it. It had wheels. And I'm thinking, uh-uh, that ain't never going to happen. We ain't going to put, a, put a, a dog in a, in a wheelchair type thing. Now look at me. Now all of a sudden we got a, one of these dogs is about to die. We had a medical emergency. We land down on the ground, petting the dog. We're trying to get the dog where it needs to go before it goes bye-bye. 
We want to make sure that Luke gets home from L.A. before uh, his dog goes. We're preparing a wedding and a funeral for a pet at the same time. It's ridiculous, right? Let's take this dog to the vet. So in the middle of the night, it's 2 in the morning, we're going to an emergency room and all that. All that to say, praise God, dog is fine. Bank account ain't. <laughs> okay? And so sure enough, me and Amber, I, I guess I was making a joke. I'm like, man, we poor. And she reminded me, honey, we're not poor. We just broke. <laughs> you know the difference between being poor and broke, right? Poor is you don't even know where uh, paychecks are going to come from. You can't pay for anything. We have a paycheck coming, but it's coming on the day of the wedding, on the 15th. All right? And so we got about five days here. All right? So we, 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 we not poor. We just broke. <laughs> I mean, if we want to break into our savings account, break into our, our, our retirement, if we want to do the worst ever, and that is ask the kids for money. I mean, can you imagine how embarrassing? So we're not talking to nobody about this, but I tell you what, I had $19 and one cent in my account. Look, I can't even go to the ATM to get a 20. That's what ATM stands for, right? Another 20 missing. I can't even get a 20 missing. 1901. Anyway, you know, again, we just kind of saying, okay, we got a few days here. You know, we want to get flowers for the wedding. We got people coming in from the other family. We got to feed folk. Now, again, could we use credit cards? I guess we could. So that's why I'm saying we're not poor. We broke, right? But it's been a while since we've been like this. So anyway, here we are sitting in the living room watching service. I get a text. I'm going to read what the text says. Let me see if I can find it. I put it in my notes. Are you, you ready for this? Listen to what it says. We all prayed after service and also prayed for your son's wedding. As soon as we were done praying, the Spirit of God ministered to my husband and I simultaneously to sow a love seed to you to support the wedding, et cetera. Please advise how best to transfer the funds to you expeditiously. Mm, I love that word, expeditiously. Transfer funds, are you kidding me? She doesn't know this about my 1901. We don't know this couple. We've only met them one time. But God spoke to them to bless us. And so I pulled up that Wells Fargo account. It said 1901. And then within an hour, it said 1019 and one. Come on, God, are you kidding me? Shoot, I'm not poor and I'm not broke. That's amazing, right? So God knows how to hook up not only the prophet, the man of God, but the people who need the word of God. And when the word of God and the man of God and the situation in your life all come together, God can do amazing miracles. I don't know what God's doing in the life of that couple that blessed us, but I sent a picture of that 1901, and it says now 1,019 and one. Now, thank God I get a paycheck. And thank God things are replenishing. But I'm going to tell y'all what. Here I am at this age, and I saw that 1901. I said, oh, Lord, I have mercy. What's wrong with me? I'll tell you what's wrong. God wanted to make sure you understood this passage. You may have a little bit of flour left in that jar and a little bit of oil left in that jug. But, David, I promised you that if you would hold on my word, if you would hold on to my vision, if you would do what I told you to do, that jar will never go empty and that oil will never run dry. You know, bread is to feed you. It's about provision. Oil in the Bible represents joy and anointing. And so you can be sure that if you hold on to God's word, your joy will always be there. And the anointing and the favor of God will always be on your life. Another woman emailed me to tell me that she wonders if her and her husband are falling out of favor with God 
because she's done every single thing that she could to honor God and to praise God. She's given her money to the Lord. She's given her marriage to the Lord. She was just so concerned. So she actually wrote me and said, Pastor, do you think that the favor of God is off of our family? Well, what she doesn't know is six hours later, I got an email from a brother in the Lord who says, I feel like God wants us to bless somebody whose hope is dying and who needs encouragement and who needs a favor from God. That happened six hours prior. So when this lady writes me this email, I'm able to go to this guy and say, you're not going to believe this, but I believe that God wants us to bless this woman. So we get on a call together and we talk to her and her husband and we're able to bless her and her husband to let her and her husband know this is what the word of God says. We must have given her seven or eight scriptures and she's writing down these scriptures and we're telling her God has not forsaken her. We're telling her that God has a plan uh, for her and her marriage. We're praying for them. We're encouraging them. And then on top of that, we bless them financially, ridiculously with thousands of dollars. Do you think she walked away realizing that even though the oil seemed to have run dry, it hadn't run out yet? Why? Because God had already spoken to someone else about her. And none of us knew each other, but God is in the divine hookup business. I'm telling you this because I want you to be encouraged that when God makes a house call, whether it comes through a telephone call or whether he brings Zoom into the room to make your whole worship go boom, I'm saying to you, that God can do divine hookups. And he says, I stand at the door and I knock. And if anybody would open the door and let me in, I will come in and eat with him and sup with him and he with me. God is looking for people who will open the door of their heart and open the door of their home. So when he makes a house call, they welcome him in. That's what happened with Zacchaeus. In the New Testament, Zacchaeus was in a tree and he sees that Jesus is coming and he's about to speak to the crowds. And Zacchaeus is, says, Lord, Wow, let me, let, me, let me listen to what the Lord has to say. Zacchaeus is a tax collector. Jesus sees him up in the tree because he was a short dude, so he had to climb the tree to see what Jesus was doing. And Jesus sees him in the tree and says, Zacchaeus, I'm coming to your house today. You see, God is still in the house call business. And so sure enough, Jesus goes to Zacchaeus' house and it says that the, the, the change in Zacchaeus' heart was so great that he paid people four times the money that he ripped them off. He used to be a tax collector and he would not only collect the taxes, but then he'd take all this extra money and put it in his pocket. And all the people he ripped off because God changed his heart, God also changed his wallet. And so he went and paid back restitution. You know, that's what this country needs too. This country needs restitution for the things that it has done uh, to African Americans. You know, it's done things to other groups as well. And they have received some kind of reparations or restitution. Well, friends, listen, when God makes a house call, he gets your heart right. Our country needs to get their heart right. Stop trying to hold on to the last of your oil. Do what God says and God will change your heart. So I don't have to tell you to give me restitution. Let God tell you that when you repent, you got to make things right. When you repent before God as a nation, God will tell you what to do. I shouldn't have to tell you what to do. The victim should never have to tell you what to do to make it right. Give back what you owe and then go over that several times for the hurt and the harm that you have caused. That's what the scripture teaches. And Zacchaeus shows us that. And we also see in this message that when the word of God comes into your house, God will always bless you. And he will always make sure that even when you can't put a card in an ATM just to get another 20, he can bless you with more than you could get out of that card in one day at the ATM because you can only get 500 out anyway. God doubled it. I couldn't have gotten even $1,000 out of that. But let me tell you something about Cash App. Let me transfer the funds expeditiously. Hmm. In a moment, God can transfer expeditiously to your account favor, grace, healing, peace, and joy. He can restore your marriage, your home. He can transfer expeditiously your son or your daughter coming back home. He can expeditiously do things that you cannot even imagine. Just give them the little that you have, a little faith can multiply into a big miracle. Well, this is how I want to close today. I want to close to make a home call for you. <laughs> I want to pray for you in your home right now. I want you to imagine me in your living room, in your car, 
wherever you are right now, I'm making a house call. It's amazing what God has done because through COVID, he has now made us a multi-site church by the thousands. We used to say we're a multi-site church. Columbia, Maryland, and a campus in Owens Mills, Town, Maryland. Now we got about 15,000 campuses, 20,000 campuses. That's right. We're a multi-site church. You just name the place and we're there. Why? Because of this broadcast. And so I'm going to pray for you and your home right now. So if you don't mind praying with me, close your eyes, grab hands with your family members, lift your hands to the air, whatever it is you need to do, make this your moment to receive this blessing. I'm going to pray over you. Does anybody need a house call today? Does anybody need their oil multiplied? Does anybody need more bread for their son? What well, comes through the word of God? So let me speak that word over you now. Lord Jesus, for every person under the sound of my voice, I pray your hope over them, your healing over them, your help in their house. Lord, I pray that you would turn their lack into provision, that you would turn the things that they are fearing into faith, that you would bring them sustenance and deliverance and victory, and direction. I pray, Lord, that this word that I cannot preach, this spoken rhema word that I cannot give, but you, by the power of your Holy Spirit, can take this word and this prayer and change the trajectory of their life. I pray, God, that you would change the trajectory of their life from death to life, from sickness to healing, from division to oneness, from non-health to great health, Lord, from poverty to wealth. Not that they can use it for themselves, Lord, but that they would use it to bless the world. Lord, I pray that you would speak a word of peace right now, a word of power. I speak a word of promise, a word of provision. God, I pray even now that you would heal that man that's watching me from his car and his cell phone. That man that is crying right now as he sits in his truck, God, I pray that you would envelop his whole vehicle right now by the power of your spirit. I pray for that single mother who is watching right now with her child in her arms, God. I pray that you would let her know that you are with her and that you will help her with that child and you will help her with the resources she needs. Give her strength, God. I pray, God, for that elderly couple right now who's struggling with their breathing, struggling with their energy. I pray that this word is breathing life and energy into them right now. I pray for that couple that is watching the service in their living room right now, that you would begin to break the, the bounds and the boundaries between them so that they would become one again. I pray for that teenager that's sitting on the couch in that house watching this sermon reluctantly, Lord, that by the power of your spirit, you would break through to let them know that this message is for them, not just for their parents. I pray for repentance in this house. I pray for repair in this house. I pray for restitution in this house. And I pray that they would make a de declarative statement that as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Thank you, God, for being a God who still makes house calls.